Hello, everybody, and welcome to Answers News for Wednesday, August 26th of 2020. I call it the year that never ends, and the hits just keep coming. I'm your host, Mr. P, today, Mr. Roger Patterson. We've got Dr. Jennifer Hall Rivera and Tim Chafee joining us. Now, you might notice we've got a little different setup. We're not relegating somebody to the back row anymore, but still trying to keep that distancing. Uh, glad you guys can join us today. Uh, we'll be monitoring a lot of the comments and things that are coming in through the Answers in Genesis Facebook page and the YouTube channel, so encourage you to hop on there. We've got a great studio audience with us today. You guys can clap and let everybody know you're here. All right. <laughs> We've got a great slate of articles today. Um, the first one is really cool. Mm -hmm. Glowing, whoops, sorry. Mic's on. <laughs> sorry. Glowing Whatever. plankton create bioluminescent waves off the California coast. So this is really amazing. Is what we see is light producing plankton uh, that due to the motion, uh, you know, causes a chemical reaction and they actually glow this beautiful light blue. So we're gonna watch a little clip Yeah, we've got a little clip of this so mm -hmm. you can see this blue effect here with these phytoplankton. Blue waves crashing on the California coastline. Look at this. This was in Monterey Bay recently. We saw a similar phenomenon along the Southern California coast earlier this year. These are bioluminescent waves. According to the Monterey Bay Aquarium, the light is produced by trillions of tiny organisms in the sea. It can happen during a red tide, though, as you can see, the effect produces a deep blue. Now, this type of phytoplankton is called a dinoflagellate, and they've got little whip-like structures that help them move through the water. Uh, these are the same creatures that we think of are associated with a red tide. This is a little different species. Some of them are bioluminescent and some of them aren't. But here we see this really cool blue effect as the waves churn up these things. And even if you had somebody like on a surfboard or walking through the waves, you see those types of things. Yeah, I was showing them a video before that was taken a few years back in San Diego where there's a guy surfing at night on these waves and every time he turns the surfboard a little bit, you get this big flash of blue. So you can look that up, it's, it's really neat. Yeah, mm -hmm. just an amazing uh, part of creation. Now we see lots of different uh, bioluminescent fish and bacteria and phytoplankton, all types of different things all over the world and another hallmark of God's design. Yeah. Why did this need to happen? Um, from the evolutionary perspective, they try to explain it as this little flash of light might detract a predator and maybe that gave an, an advantage. But really to create that chemical and the complex interactions that are going on inside the cell, that's gotta cost you more energy than it saves you, especially when you're around by the trillions yes. like <laughs> these little things are. And so we, we wouldn't buy that evolutionary explanation, but an amazing design God's given some of his creatures. All right, penguins are Aussies or are they Kiwis? So this is kind of an interesting study because they actually uh, made like the first penguin genome from 18 different penguin species. So it's kind of fascinating. And what they found is, what, what basically the focus of the article is, well, you know, that penguins live in warm climates and they live in Antarctica and cold climates. And they're saying, for penguins to have the ability to live in such drastic climate conditions, this is something that must have adapted over millions of years. Yeah, right? I think we'd probably get a, a debate between Ken Ham and Ray Comfort over where these penguins came from. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Ken being from Australia and Ray being from uh, New Zealand. But this looks at a very interesting genome study, mm -hmm. and we can appreciate very much the way that they're using these different DNA sequencing techniques to examine the different genomes. Now, even a, a decade ago, this would have taken way too long to be able to accomplish on this many species, but able to look at 18 different species and get an entire genome sequence is a very, uh, very marvelous thing, <laughs> looking mm -hmm. at this from a, a scientist's perspective, to be able to have that much data to examine and compare these things. But of course, they're coming at this uh, from an evolutionary perspective, and they're going to make the wrong conclusions because they've got the wrong foundation. A quote here from the, the article in Science Daily, but we want to make the point that it has taken millions of years for penguins to be able to occupy such diverse habitats, and at that rate, that the oceans are warming, penguins are not going to be able to adapt fast enough to keep up with changing climate. So of course, these scientists are concerned with the changing climate that's happening around the world and how that's gonna affect these birds, these flightless birds, 
that live all over the Southern Hemisphere. Now, if you aren't familiar with penguins, and you think of penguins just as the frozen wastelands of Antarctica, they actually live all over the Southern Hemisphere in South America and Southern Africa and in the Galapagos Islands as far north as the equator. But you'll never find them with polar bears because those are in the north, despite what the Coke commercials tell you. That's not, <laughs> that's not reality. I do like how they say here, though the exchange of genetic material, penguins may have shared genetic traits that facilitate in their, in their diversification. Well, that's exactly what we'd expect to see. They're all just penguins, right? Mm -hmm. And so we would expect, even in the 18 you know, different species that they analyze, we see a lot of the potential to have diversification, which God put there to allow them to live in these different climates. Uh, that's baffling evolutionists, but does not baffle us when we look at it from a biblical view. Right, and we make this point at the Ark Encounter and here at the Creation Museum many times where we, you have variation within a kind and you, these animals are able to adapt to certain climates and, and certain areas. And that's, throughout this article, you have a lot of good science that's being done. And then it seems like every third paragraph they have to throw in, and evolution this, and millions of years this, um, this, uh, this statement. The genome comparisons told them that penguins arose between 21 million and 22 million years ago. No, the genome comparison didn't tell them anything like that. It didn't speak. It didn't tell them that. It's just their interpretation of it. And it, it is interesting they use, when they do these DNA studies, what they call shotgun sequencing. And mm -hmm. Roger, maybe you can uh, elaborate on that a little bit, where they're just taking a little tiny bit, because in order to get the whole sequence, that's going to take a long time. So they take just a snippet and then compare those. Yeah, and as they look at those, those sections and then work to fill in the gaps, they often use different scaffolding patterns. So for example, when they built the, the human genome, genome and the chimp genome, they compared those things and assumed their evolutionary relationships and tried to build those things together. So we've got to be careful with those, um, with those analyses because they are going to come from that wrong foundation. And if we start with the idea that these 20-some different species that they looked at were, or 18 different species were in these different habitats and they evolved over millions of years, well, then that would seem like a threat if things are changing so rapidly they wouldn't be able to adapt. But if we look at it from the perspective of the flood, we think of those things as diversifying from about 4,000 years ago, and that doesn't seem like a very rapid change. And these penguins are going to be able to adapt to those changing climates. Uh, now, there might be some stresses and populations are going to fluctuate. Uh, we see that all the time. But God's created his creatures to be able to survive those changes and overcome them. And it's interesting that they can tell which ones are more closely related than others. Mm -hmm. That's something that I think we would be interested in as well, is where did they go after the flood? And those, so did they come from Australia or New Zealand? Let's go back to the original <laughs> article. Well, the article says both. So, yeah, and we spoiler can, alert. Yeah, we can <laughs> confirm that these are the same kind of bird. They all are related to one another. There's interfertility. They can breed with one another and hybridize. So that builds into that concept of the kind as God created them in Genesis 1. All right, Drag Queen Story Hour post-tweet deemed pedophilic locks account after pushback. Uh, so this is kind of a good case where Twitter intervened and did lock down some social media after uh, they posted that uh, love is... Love has no, no age. age right. The tag. And uh, when the Drag Queen Story Hour posted this comment, I was interpreted as very much... Uh, pedophilic, right? Definitely. Yep. And this, this group, what they do is they organize story time at community mm -hmm. centers and libraries and other places where men dressed up as women in drag, often very gaudy costumes, will go and perform and read and talk about their lifestyle to these kids. And when you then attach that idea to this phrase, love has no age, which is being used by those who would identify as having uh, pedophilic tendencies, then what, are we, what else are we to assume but that you're endorsing that type of, of view? Right, and, and some of these groups have pushed for a lower age of consent. You know, NAMBLA, which has been around for a long time, North yes. American Man-Boy Love Association, they, for a long time their phrase was, aid is too late. And it just tells you how disgusting mm -hmm. some of these, these groups are. And, and we talked about you know, how they're trying to change the label here too, yeah, right? right? They're trying to make it not as, uh, you know, Pedophile you has this, right, this condescending right, this overtone right. to it. So rather they've picked up a, the euphemism, minor attracted mm -hmm. persons. Now we'll say things like he kicked the bucket to make death sound more palatable. But when we, when we start turning things that are sinful into soft sounding phrases, 
we are going to fall into all kinds of traps. We need to be careful to use the Bible's terminology and the Bible's phrasing of these sinful activities so that we can recognize them as sin, not just some new disorder or some, uh, some new way to think about love. But this is a very common approach. They do this on all sorts of things because it, they wear you down after a while. You, you mm -hmm. get tired of trying to constantly explain things and why something is wrong, and they'll continually change the wording so that it's something that sounds palatable, like you said. And oftentimes people give in and they just start using that language and then you've lost the debate as soon as you give, you give up the vocabulary. So you, you got to stand firm. I think we just caution parents as well, right? Absolutely. Don't, you know, if you ever see this going on at a local library or something you're attending and this kind of event's going on, it'd be very prudent of you to not allow and, your child to attend. And raise concern yep. as much mm -hmm. as you have the opportunity yes. to, to appeal to the library or yes. to other people in, in authority appeal that this is a, a wicked thing and they shouldn't be pursuing these things. All right, got your bag? The critical place of mobile containers in human evolution. Now, I, as a man, I feel like I need to have a purse with me or something for right, this. Some <laughs> kind of bag, right? This article actually, Roger, they're almost... You can, uh, your, you can get your fanny bag. <laughs> yeah. right. they're, they're almost mystified in this article that humans, you know developed bags, right? That we had this ingenuity because we're just animals, right? We're mm -hmm. just, you know, equivalent to the animal population. Uh, and that, you know, we were intelligent enough and, you know, ingenious enough to develop a bag to carry our things, right? Yeah, so again, this is gonna tie into that evolutionary view. The whole undertone of this article is humans are just animals. And so the ability to carry things around with them and plan for the future with that, having that bag handy, all of those pieces are just part of that evolutionary framework that the world is gonna to tend to look at these things through. Mm -hmm. So as an animal, if we weren't a kangaroo or a possum or something that already had a pouch, we'd have to develop that pouch to be able to carry those things around with us. And then that would presumably give an advantage over this tribe of primates who was smart enough to make a bag to carry those tools from place to place with them that they wouldn't have to recreate them each time. And that advantage then allowed them to prosper and we get the survival of the fittest uh, framework in place for the rise of smarter and smarter individuals over time. Right, because if you don't have the bag, you just got two spears or whatever it might be, or you, you can only have a couple of, of tools, but if you have the bag, you can put a whole bunch of tools. Isn't that amazing? I mean, who would have ever thought of that? I, I think that, I made the joke earlier, maybe it was a, a mother who did as she's carrying around the, the baby, thinking, you know, I can carry other things if I have something else other than just my, my hands to carry the baby. But um, we, we see from, uh, you know, from post-flood world, some of the, one of the earliest, um, human remains that we find is Utsi, the ice man. Mm -hmm. And uh, they found out that he carried a whole bunch of tools in his, in his quiver that he had. And, and the things that he had with him amazed scientists. They, he had a copper axe. They thought, well, this is a thousand years too early. People weren't supposed to be able to have those things. And what we see repeatedly when we look back at ancient man is that man was intelligent from the beginning. Just like scripture tells us, it's the opposite of what the evolutionary view tells us, which is that we're coming up from the apes and getting smarter and smarter and smarter. No man has been intelligent from the beginning. And um, you know what, uh, speaking of bags, Roger, I mean, you are a disc golfer. I don't yeah. know if you guys know this, but Roger loves disc golf. Would you have ever imagined that if you were out there playing, you can carry two or three, you know, in, one, in your yeah, hands? Yeah, you've got to sit bag, them down you could get and like pick 10 them up different... and your back gets sore bending over all the time. <laughs> right, you can, you can have a whole bunch of them in a bag. I mean, what was I thinking? You should invent that. that for disc golfers. <laughs> that, that'd be a great thing to do. And, and, and speaking of bags, you know what? We have some mobile containers <laughs> available here that you can get, and you can fill it with all sorts of Answers in Genesis books and DVDs and other things mm -hmm. uh, while you're here. So, sorry for those of you watching online, we don't sell the bags online. You'll have to come to the museum or the, or the ARC, uh, yep. museum or ARC. They'll just have to those. come visit. Yep. Yes. One thing I do want to commend the article for is, at least in the, one of the diagrams they used, they showed a very clear line of speculation and then things that were based on evidence. So they're willing to acknowledge that we don't know that these certain things happened, but they're using their evolutionary view to, to work those back into that time scale. But of course, it's an unbiblical time scale. It goes back to hundreds of thousands of years in their framework of thinking rather than a few thousand. And in the course of the article, while they're talking about man is just another animal, they're really showing that we're set apart because right. they're, they're talking about, do, do other animals use these things other than marsupials? Do they have, do they have bags? Do they make tools? Those are gonna, well, someone will use them like a crow might use something that's already there, but they don't 
pass them on to the next generation. They don't, they don't think through why this might be helpful. They don't decorate them to make them attractive to others <laughs> around, all those types of things. Now, a lot of those ideas and things that we talk about from an evolutionary perspective, if you stop by and get one of these bags, you could also pick up this book, Glass House. And in that book, it does have a lot of uh, questions about the evolutionary paradigm and how we can look at that from both a scientific and a biblical perspective and give answers for these things. So what we do here on these news panels is apply principles that you can find in books like that to these articles in the media that we're that are faced with every day. So if you want to hone your skills or help train children, grandchildren, a glass house is a great resource for that. Yeah, and I think the bag's big enough, you could even fit two copies of that in there. One for and you and one, one for a friend. friend. <laughs> but notice in these articles, a lot of what happens, there, there is some interesting science that they're sharing, some of the scientific data that they're, that they're coming up with in their research, and then they're spinning it all based on their worldview, which goes back to what we have said repeatedly as a ministry, that all of this data is interpreted through that framework, through uh, whether it's from a biblical perspective, as we, uh, as we do here, or from an evolutionary perspective, just like you see in our starting points exhibit in the Creation Museum. We're looking at the same objects and yet interpreting them from a different perspective. All right, we've got a question here from Daniel. We've got other people joining us from South Carolina and right down the road in Walton, Kentucky. Uh, Daniel says, does evolution explain why fashion bags that can hold a small cell phone can be sold for $6,000? How does that fit into the paradigm? I don't understand. I'll have to let a lady answer that one. I, I don't know if I could answer that either, because I know I certainly would not spend $6,000. I, I want to on modify my earlier statement that man has been intelligent from the beginning. Not all people have not been all people. intelligent. No. I, I do wear cargo pants a lot, and my wife calls them my purse pants, because I can fit everything in my pants pockets that she does in her purse. So I'll give her that one. All right, moving on to our next right. article. Earliest known beds are 227,000-year-old piles of grass and ash. So in this cave in uh, southern Africa, they found uh, what they believe to be some of the earliest examples of bedding that people may have used. And then this grass that was left behind, they evaluated it, did some chemical analysis on it, and discovered uh, that it had been burnt and that there was some camphor added to it, both which are natural insect repellents. So it's kind of interesting to see how maybe, you know, they possibly would have burned, you know, certain substances so that when they slept on that bedding, it would be free of you know, insects and things like that that you wouldn't want in your bedding surface. Irritating you at night. Yeah. Now, I just want to know, do they come in California King? Because I'm 6'6 <laughs> six, six and Tim's 6'9. Six, we need a little more space. So right. I doubt yeah. they were that big. But here again, we have another example <laughs> of a, a historical find. We've archaeologically identified these things in certain layers. Mm -hmm. Now, the layers and the caves and how they come up with the dating is really, again, based from that evolutionary paradigm. But we would view these things as an example of people building these structures likely after the Ice Age or during the Ice Age period as people are moving around and they're just finding comfortable places to live in these caves. Because if you're in a very, either a very hot climate or a very cold climate, a cave is going to offer you respite from either of those extremes and give a good place. Now, exactly how these were used and exactly what they're for, that's where we get into a bit of conjecture in the historical science, trying to understand those pieces as well as the timing. And I think, Dr. Rivera, you'd probably like a lot of the research here because they're doing forensics. Like, mm -hmm. They're trying to figure out, you know, why were these things used in, in this cave? Who was using them? And th that's interesting stuff. But what they did at the very end of the article uh, her team presumes the people living in Border Cave 227,000 years ago were modern humans, Homo sapiens, but cannot be sure it wasn't another speci species such as Homo naledi. Just one little shot in there, which, by the way, Homo naledi is... Um, does naledi really deserve the title Homo? I really don't think so. Yeah, most likely um, just another... Uh, another type Like of an ape. Australopithecine, another, another ape, and uh, maybe a different species than Lucy was, but something like Lucy. Um, and not human at all, so they wouldn't have had these sorts of anything that you find in the cave. And now, another very interesting thing that belies the time scale issue, uh, it says here, Wadley's team has found grass bedding in many of these later layers made from several species, including Panicum maximum, which still grows outside the cave. Maybe that's because 
it's only been growing there for thousands of years, and that's that a old. common grass right. that's found in that area. Mm -hmm. So from a biblical perspective, we have a much more reasonable explanation. Why would we expect that exact same grass to be growing there over hundreds of thousands of years? The range they're mm -hmm. giving here is 183 to 227,000 years. Why would we expect that? The climate's gonna change, the conditions are gonna change, that shouldn't be the case. And so from a biblical perspective, we have a much more sound explanation for those things. All right, Google bans a viral video showing a former abortionist describing how abortions are done. So Dr. Anthony Levitino uh, recorded a video in 2016 that's been available for, but for almost four years now. Uh, it had over 1.8 million views where he actually uh, kind of walks through, uh, you know, the four types of abortions that, you know, he performed and that he is familiar with as a doctor and obstetrician. Uh, and recently, Google banned the video, right, pulled the video, uh, saying it contained inappropriate content and sexual content and things like that, even though it was very tastefully done with, you know, I would say almost like cartoon-like images. Yeah, they're trying to use like cartoon that, right? He's trying to show you what's actually happening, though. Uh, it was an excellent video. And thank goodness, right, people started complaining about that and, uh, you know, protesting the fact that they had pulled this video. And it has been reinstated, so you actually can go view this video now. Now, this mm -hmm. is an example of um, someone who was formerly an abortionist, mm -hmm. knows these procedures very intimately, has performed them, uh, knows the process that happens, and he was just trying to give a factual account for the record. Now, he has changed his mind on those things. He's no longer willing to do abortions. And so he's using that as a platform to expose the, the vile and disgusting and, and terrible things that happen during an abortion procedure. And that is something that makes people afraid because it presents the truth in a way that's very gruesome. Now, people don't ban ideas that are good. They, I, they ban ideas that are bad. So the, pro, uh, the people who call themselves pro-choice want to ban this bad idea because they get the information out and then people are going to recognize what's happening. We have, to, we have to ban that. People don't ban good ideas. They ban bad ideas from their perspective. And so here's an example of that viewpoint discrimination where they want to shut down one viewpoint Rather than giving everybody all the information, all the facts, let's look at all the scientific things that are happening here, they're trying to shut that down. Right, they don't want people to know that the baby growing in the womb is a human being that's living and growing, and uh, that's why they fight against things like the, some of the laws that are, that are passed in certain states where the, you have to show an ultrasound to the woman before she uh, has an abortion, because they know so many people will change their mind once they see that, that this, is, this really is a baby, not a lump, a clump of cells. And if you want to see some of the ultrasound videos, you've got to come back in a month, because mm -hmm. we are opening up our Fearfully and Wonderfully Made exhibit right out here, and it's gonna be fantastic. Uh, the guys uh, and gals at the design studio that I work with are working really hard to get all the models ready, and the exhibit's just, it's beautiful. Uh, so I'd encourage you to check that out. Uh, one month from today, it'll be open. Actually, the 25th is our yeah. opening day, and um, so we're really excited about that. And at the end here, it just shows how uh, you know, a lot of times Google and, and Facebook and some of these other groups will say, oh, it's just an algorithm. We don't actually target any single group. Well, back in 2018, when Ireland um, first allowed abortion because of a, vote, a referendum, within one week of that referendum, that, that vote taking place, Google um, interfered with three different phrases being searched, Irish Catholic, unborn life, and abortion is wrong, so that people couldn't find videos or articles related to that. Really, that was just an accident. That just happened by chance that people couldn't find information uh, when they were searching for it. No, it's obviously intentional, and uh, we need to be aware of those things. And yeah, we have to remember that corporations are often presenting their, their political views and their other views and putting those out in the public. Now, that's not wrong. Every corporation has the right to do that. But we just need to be aware that there's a lot of um, propaganda, propagandizing going on with those types of things. Now, if you do choose to go watch this video, I would caution you not to let younger kids view it, or it may be a way to help bring education to your teens to let them know what's happening in these different procedures so that they're not ignorant of those things. And that can be a great tool in engaging with those people who are pro-choice who may not know what happens in those situations. But in all of this, we have to remember that even when these grievous sins like abortion happen, there's still hope and there's still repentance in, found in Christ and trusting in Christ. 
And that can bring about changed hearts and changed minds. And as much as we can work for laws and, and other structures that are going to prevent abortions, we want the gospel to be the focus of those, uh, of those initiatives and efforts so that really hearts are changed and minds are changed, not just attitudes and actions. And I think he was a good example of that because he talks about how he performed over 12,000 abortions. So we're not talking about someone who, you know, only did a few. He had performed thousands of abortions. And I like how at the end of the video, he kind of explains what, you know, what changed his heart and what made him realize uh, how wrong this was. So uh, it's, it's definitely worth watching for parents, absolutely. But bring it back to our worldview perspective. From a biblical creationist worldview, abortion is wrong because it's the, it's the taking of a human life who is made in the image of God. That's why we have values, because we're made in God's image. It's not because of anything great that we've done. It's because of who we are, because of what our creator has done. But from an evolutionary perspective, What's a human being? Just another animal like we've seen in several of the articles. And if it's from a naturalistic evolutionary worldview where, where there is no God or anything, then we're, you're no more important than the chairs you're sitting on. You're no more important than a blade of grass or a rock. We're all just a bunch of chemicals that are mixed together. And uh, so that, this kind of thing is consistent with their worldview, but it's very inconsistent with a biblical worldview. All right, a 429 million year old trilobite had eyes like those of modern bees, right? So this is a great example of a fossil uh, that, as we were saying earlier, is basically was cracked and allowed scientists to kind of get a sneak peek into the structure uh, of their eyes. Uh, and it was kind of interesting because I actually found out, wow, they're very similar to other, you know, arthropods that we see today, mm -hmm. and that's yeah. exactly what we expect to see. So, so we see yeah. lots of these uh, trilobite fossils. We actually have some here at the Creation Museum. Mm -hmm. We've got a trilobite trackway featured up in the Creation Museum. And their amazing preservation actually lets us see into the details of the cellular structure inside of sections like the, the lens and the eye. And so this fossil, having been cracked across the eye, allowed the scientists to get in there and study it more carefully and see all those things in great detail. Now, if we think about this happening 500 million years ago and being caught in some uh, flood sediment or some dying and settling to the bottom of a lake somewhere, there's no way to preserve that much detail. So from a biblical perspective, we'd understand this to be a flood relic. This is something that was likely wiped out in the flood and buried very quickly in a low oxygen environment where there was no opportunity for scavengers to come in or bacteria to eat it away. And we get that exquisite preservation of all of those things. And just like we've seen in, in soft tissue and other things, we get that amazing detail down to the cellular level. And they do admit that in the article, mm -hmm. right? They actually have a quote that says, well, delicate cellular structures, especially in the eyes, often rely on rapid burial in oxygen-depleted environments, right? It's exactly what we would expect to see from a biblical worldview. All right, next article. All right, evolution of the primate larynx faster than in other mammals, right? Just another example of evolution here. Uh, what they did is they looked at 55 species of primate, and they actually, was, it was kind of neat how they did it. They did do voice box scans, and they actually built 3D computer models of their larynx, and they were trying to compare the size of the larynx to the body size of the primate, and what they found is the, in, in proportion between the larynx and the body size of the body, that they were unusually large, right? Mm -hmm. That's basically what they said. Yeah. But, you know, if you've ever heard, of, if you've ever been at the zoo, you know, and you've heard the primates. The howler monkeys and yes, all those things. they can be They're called howler loud, monkeys right? for a reason. <laughs> for a reason, right? Yeah. <laughs> And if you think about, so your larynx is your voice box right back here underneath uh, your tongue in the back of your throat there. And it does a lot of cool things for us. It helps us breathe and it helps us eat and it helps us speak. And all of those different things are part of the design God has given us. So looking at this from an evolutionary perspective, did they really blow you away with their facts there, Tim? No. <laughs> no, um, that's, that's all I got to say. No, it, they really it didn't. It just they... really was not much there. It's like, uh, mm -hmm. yeah, Duh, but... Yeah, there's a lot of variation within primates, more so than what you might find in dogs or in some of the other animals. And, and of course, they're lumping humans in with primates again. So uh, they, it's just another one of these articles where it really seems like the whole goal is let, let's just, whatever we find, let's 
fit evolution into it. Let's mm -hmm. try to squeeze that in there. And, but it is interesting when they talk about the, the quote unquote evolution of religion, uh, or not religion, Language. I'm sorry, languages, sorry. Languages, right. Um, they talked sorry, about theology that. coming out here. <laughs> <laughs> but the evolution of languages, and they talk about how they still don't know how the languages arose. Was it one that diverged into many, um, which we would say, Yes, <laughs> but read Genesis 11, you'll see that the whole earth had one speech, one tongue, and then what happened at Babel, God confused that language, and then you have a whole bunch of them. Or the other one, did people already scatter the out of Africa model, and then they started getting their own languages from there. Um, so it, there's still a lot that they claim they don't know. Yeah. And, well, and just they, like they're they, they are, too. Yeah, they're, yeah, they're debating the origin of humans. Did everybody come out of Africa? Or were there, was there a multi-regional model? Same thing with the language here. Did everybody come from one language? All the languages come from one language? Or were there multiple developments over time? But the only way we're going to answer those historical questions is with a historical record mm -hmm. that examines those things. And we have that in Scripture. And we can read there in Genesis 11 that the whole world had one tongue and that God confused those languages. And there's an exhibit at the Ark Encounter that does a great job of explaining that, showing how those different language families pop up. And um, even linguists will identify language families and say, this, these are related on a little tree, but where did this one connect to this one? They don't know those answers. But from a biblical perspective, we take that back to Babel. For say and the article, 90% of languages are expected to be gone by the middle of the century, and they say, sad, but that's evolution for you. <laughs> that's how they had their But it really wouldn't be evolution. You would think evolution would preserve these things. Right. And, but, I mean, it, it, as yeah. people travel more, as you have people mixing more, you're going to have some of the dominant languages are going to become even more mm -hmm. dominant, and so some, a lot of these will, probably will go yeah. uh, the way of the dodo, I guess you could yeah. say. Yeah, and it's a, it's a great reminder that God is going to call people from every tribe and tongue and nation. That tongue, they're the different languages that are expressed. And as we have opportunity to learn and use these languages, we should be doing so to share the gospel and the hope. And so hopefully there are opportunities for you to be supporting missionaries who are doing that type of work around the world. All, All right, right, our last article, Germans must walk their dogs twice a day, the new law will say. That's, wow. Wow. The headline right. itself <laughs> seems kind of rough, but when you read it, it says that walk must be... A minimum of an hour, hour, hour each time. Right. So each you got to spend two hours hour. a day walking your dog. And yes. I, I've got a little white, my daughter has a little white dog, Sully. So he could not walk for an hour straight on a hot day like today. He would just melt into a little puddle and die. So here's an example of the government trying to, trying to do a good thing. I, I would agree that it's not good to leave your dog at home, penned right. up all day, no activity, I mean, um, God has given us, you know, control of his, his creation, right? Mm -hmm. We're supposed to take care of his creations. Yeah. And but, we're supposed to care for those right. things. But to mandate across the board that you have to do one thing in all situations is a violation of the government's role. That's not something the government should be directing for us. But right. The one size fits all from the top mm -hmm. down just is not a good idea, especially with, I mean, in so many cases, it's not a good idea. But this one, yeah, if you have a little, little dog like you have... There might be enough room in the house to run around all day where it's going to get yeah. a lot of work and maybe you take it outside for a little bit. But you might have a really big dog where it can't really get any exercise in the house and you do need to take it out. But what about, like they point out in the article, what about um, dogs that are, are old and sick? You have to make sure you take them outside too and walk until they die. I mean, there's just, there's so many problems with this, you know, one, this, uh, from a centralized perspective, one rule for everybody. And we see that in more than just areas of walking dog. Yes. <laughs> so let's, let's take good care of our animals and honor God's creation in those things. All right, that's all we've got for you today. Thank you for joining us, and we will see you again back here next Monday on Answers News.